Health is not, right? We have this, we exist in this Caribbean culture where automatically you hear mental health, you hear psychologists, you hear counseling, you hear therapy. Automatically, what we think about? Crazy. Madman. Crazy. Madman, the mad crazy. people, the crazy. Right. You hear, the girl here, accessing therapy. Oh, well, she's crazy. She can't come and sit down in here because she will flip the chair and she'll mash up the screen and it will be a whole problem. Right? Automatically, when we think of mental health, we automatically think mental illness, as opposed to thinking mental well-being, right? Just as everyone has physical health, we all have mental health, right? That doesn't mean that I have a mental illness. It just means that I'm a human. We all have mental health as humans. That's how we design, right? When we speak of the mad people, how, we all, how are they usually perceived? How you usually respond to those persons? Pardon? Run from them, you chastise them, you push them aside and you exclude them from everything. Right? You exclude them, you just brush them aside because they are the crazy ones. Because I'm accessing therapeutic support, because I, what I thought was just some support because I'm a human and I don't have all the resources to treat with all of life situations, I'm being chastised for. For me seeking my betterment. For me wanting to grow as an individual. For me wanting to improve on my challenging areas. Right? I'm being chastised for that. And that shouldn't be. And that is just our Caribbean culture. That's how we exist. Right? Unfortunately so. But we now have to do our part to try to break some of these stigmas. Right? So let's speak about the mental health. How many of us, let me ask a question here, and I want you to be honest. How many of us in here ever felt stressed? Well, I find man thing real long to walk. I know what to ask. Why are you lying? You didn't come here to lie. I have to put up my hand too. If I come here and say I never feel stressed, you have to call me a liar. Because we are humans. Right? We will be faced with challenging situations that we don't have all of the resources to treat with right now. We experience some kind of stress. We experience some kind of disequilibrium. And that is okay. Why that is okay, anybody? Why that's okay? Because we what? Because we human. Because we are hoping human. Right? I don't know about you all, but I'm human. I experience some challenging moments too. Right? How I treat with my challenging moments will determine how I move forward. If I move forward in a healthy way, if I move forward in an unhealthy way, or if I remain stuck in the situation. Right? What are some things that we can't possibly do to preserve our mental health? To ensure that our mental health is not compromised? Before we get to that, when we speak of mental health, what is that? Can anybody tell me? What is your mental health? Taking care of me. Taking care of me. That's a major part of it. Taking care of me. How do I improve my mental health? How do I ensure that I am not compromised? I take care of me. When we speak of mental health, we speak about our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors, how we interact with the world around us, how we engage the world around us. Right? That's what, that's what we speak about when we hear mental health, not mental illness, which is a whole different part of the spectrum that we pay so much emphasis to, right? The important part is the mental well-being, your mental health. The World Health Organization, the WHO, said that we all have mental health, and they're absolutely right. Just as we all have physical health, we all have mental health. We are humans. That's how we design, right? And another way of treating with our mental health concerns there's something that we do as humans that allows us to feel better when we get it out. What does this? Anybody can tell me what that is? What that would look like? Communicate. I hear communicate. We talk about things. We, we, we vent. Right? That's what we do as humans. We vent. Right? We are designed as social beings. That's the advantage we have. We are designed to socialize. We are designed to use language. To speak about things. You'll ever hear, and I'm, we hear this so often that it has become so cliche. Talk about it, you'll feel lighter. You get off your chest. You'll ever hear that? It's so true. But we've used it so loosely and so often that you hear it and you really pay attention to how powerful that actually is. Right? You talk about things, you get it off. You get it off your chest, you get it out. Right? As humans, that's how we are designed. We are designed to socialize. 
and women more so than men. Women process language on both hemispheres of the brain. Men process language on one hemisphere of the brain. Women are more inclined to laugh with the women saying, ah, mm -hmm. they're glad, they like to hear that one, yeah. right? <laughs> women are more inclined to language-based tasks. Women tend to develop language and communication skills earlier than, than young boys, right? That is just how your brain is designed. Now the men are not trained in the shade for us. They're not saying that we can't socialize and we can't talk. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But, but just how we are, women are naturally designed. They process language on both hemispheres, we process language on one. We are more inclined to um, number, number tasks, arithmetic, that kind of stuff, right? So when we talk about things, we get it off our chest. We are designed to socialize. We need to socialize. We need to raise these issues, right? We can't see our mental health concerns. But what we can do is understand that we're experiencing it, and we speak about it. We vocalize it. We get it out there, right? In treatment with your mental health, we spoke about it before, exercise. A major part is exercise. Right? How does exercise help my mental health? Anybody can tell me how bridge the gap for me. Where's the correlation? What mental health have to do with exercise? What, have, what exercise have to do with my mental health? Oh, yeah, yeah. You increase your heart rate, it clears your blood, it reduces stress. Right? So my friend here spoke about the, the, um, the chemicals that are released when we exercise. And don't tell me how you are allergic to exercise, you can't exercise, eh? <laughs> right? I'm not saying you have to go every day and run 10 miles and run 20 miles and do 200 push-ups like my boy here, right? <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But something as simple as taking a walk, you're just getting that body's chemistry reconfigured, right? I like to call exercise the life hack. They are medications to help you elicit that chemical reaction in your body. Something as simple as exercise elicits that same chemical response, that same chemical reaction. And the brain is so fascinating, the human brain is so fascinating that naturally when we exercise, the brain recognizes that as a threat, eh? as stress. But because of how we are designed, how the brain is designed, there's a chemical or a hormone that is released called BDNF, Brain Derived Neurotropic Factor. Big word, BDNF, simply means that, that that hormone prepares the brain for that fight or flight response, right? So it protects the brain and it prepares the brain for that activity that you're about to undergo. And that coupled with the dopamine, the serotonin, oxytocin, that makes you feel good. Those are the feel-good hormones that you feel that high after your exercise, you feel better. You feel happy, you feel more relaxed, you feel more composed. In a space, you're better able to make decisions, you're better able to process your thoughts, you have better clarity. Something as simple as exercise. I like to call it the life hack. Right? You don't have to take the medication, still, it's that same chemical response. Right? Something as simple as exercise. But you have to know what works for you. Right? So there, there, are, other, there are other ways that you can achieve the same thing. Not the same chemical response, but in terms of your mental well-being, being intact. But you have to know what works for you. A simple way that we preserve our mental well-being. We do the things that we like. We take care of ourselves. You have to do what works for you. So for me personally, I like the outdoors. I'm not a party guy. I don't be in the feds. You wouldn't find me. you find me at the beach. you find me by a waterfall. But I can't tell anybody or everybody I know, hey, let me go on a hike. Let's take a hike to a waterfall. And then at the end of the hike, you're more stressed than before <laughs> because you don't like to get sweaty, you don't like the bugs, you don't like the dirt, you don't like all that, all that extensive work into the, to the waterfall. So you're more stressed than before. You have to know what works for you. Right? So what are, some, what are some things that work for you? What are some things that you do to feel good? Anybody? Music and dance. I hear somebody say ballroom dancing. I like that. Real specific. I like the ballroom dancing. Right? You like to read. You like to bake a cake. I like to eat the cake, but <laughs> you know what, you have to do what works for you, right? Anybody else on the side? What are some ways that you, you, what are some things that you do to make yourself feel good? What are some ways that you, you know, um, what are some ways that you make yourself feel happy? Make yourself feel good, make yourself feel passionate? Anybody on this side? Yoga. Yoga. Right, I want to hear one more from this side, this side quiet. Spend time with your children. You spend time with your children. Spend time with your loved ones. You do the things that make you feel good. And I like to call these things emotional deposits. So if I go to the bank, if I go to the, my 
say Republic Mac, I go by the ATM today, and I withdraw cash. And then I go by the ATM tomorrow, and I withdraw cash. And the day after, I withdraw cash. And the day after that, I, I'm not saying I have that much cash to withdraw. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Don't watch my money, right? But um, if that was the case, and I keep withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing, what's going to happen in the end? I'll be trying, I'm going to go bankrupt. I'm going to go bankrupt, right? But what do I need to start doing now to ensure that I don't go bankrupt? I need to make some deposits, just as your emotional bank. Just as your emotional bank. When we experience stress, when these things take from us, you ever encounter a situation or an interaction with someone and you feel, we like to say we feel heavy after, or you feel drained, that is your emotional bank being compromised. Your mental well-being is compromised. How do I now recognize that level of self-awareness? It has to be here. For you to now recognize that, okay, I am being compromised at this moment, I need to make some deposits. As fast as I experience that emotional withdrawal, what, what we call the stressor, whatever makes you feel you know, compromised, that is the emotional withdrawal. How do I now make some deposits? Right away, you need to make some deposits. So what for you? What are some, some emotional withdrawals for you? Me personally, traffic. Huge emotional withdrawal. But that's something that I can't avoid. That's something that I can't avoid. So every day in the traffic, you can't avoid the traffic. It is an emotional withdrawal. What do I then do? I have my music playing. Once my music playing, I get it. If you chat the whole day, we're good. If the music stops playing, we have problems. So I need to have the music playing. Right? What are some emotional withdrawals for you? Anybody? What are some of your withdrawals? Yeah. Drama. Drama. We do like the drama, we do like the comments. Well, some people like the drama, the comments. Eh? I hope that's not us here. Right? But the drama, the confusion. That could be an emotional withdrawal. Right? When I experience a situation like that, if I experience a situation that is toxic, a dramatic, toxic group of people or, or, or environment, I mean, in that environment, how do I now make a deposit? Maybe I remove myself, maybe I go take a walk, maybe I listen to some music. You just do something to regroup. Recenter yourself. On this side, what are some emotional withdrawals for you? Oh, bills. Well, let me talk about the bills. Easy one. Sometimes you feel as though your bills just line up there, wait to put that direct deposit to hit. And everything go on. An emotional withdrawal. Right? But then the emotional deposit there could be, well, all right, we will fade, everything covered. My car is mine, my house is mine. Right? All my other items are mine because my bills are paid. But it, is a, it can be an emotional withdrawal because then afterwards you're broke. <laughs> you're secure, you're secure, you're secure in the house, you're secure in the car, but you're broke. It happens, right? It happens. Right? But if you try to find a way to maintain that balance, right? Maintain that equilibrium. That is ensuring that your mental well being isn't compromised. You mentioned, as I said, it refers to how I feel, how I think, how I um, communicate with others, how I behave, how I interact with my will, how I perceive the will around me. Right? All of these things encompass your mental health, your mental well-being. Right? Um, a major, major part of it is taking care of yourself. Self-care. Self-care is very important. And there's no one way of taking care of yourself. There's no right way of taking care of yourself. You have to know what works for you. What are the things that work for you? I can't take care of myself the same way you take care of yourself. Your way of taking care of yourself might be different from hers. It's very, very specific to the individual. You have to know what works for you. Right? You don't have any concerns or any questions concerning mental health? Mm -hmm. A question. Well, I was hoping um, somebody had a question. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, you differentiated between the mental health and the mental illness. And if we have to consider mental health, then we need to consider mental illness. Right. Because if we're healthy, we might we can be unhealthy. We can be unhealthy. Right. And also dealing with the stigmas attached to that. Because if, for instance, you have a breakdown, it doesn't mean that that's going to scar, you know, that should scar you for the rest of, of your life. You know, you can recover, you can be treated, you can have medication, whatever it is. And even a person with who's on medication, also how we treat that person shouldn't be any different Correct. either because they're, they're doing something to improve, improve themselves. themselves. Yes. So what would you, how do you suggest or how, how should 
we be dealing with that type of thing? Well, to define um, mental illness, when we speak of mental illness, we speak of anything that compromises how we feel, think, behave, and interact with the world around us. How we perceive the world around us. Anything that compromises that. How we function at our best. Right? Um, what we have to, what we need to do is be very aware of mental health. What mental health is, how severe mental health is. We pay attention to mental health as opposed to just my physical health is compromised, I address that. But when my mental health is compromised, I leave it there. I leave it alone because I'm, I am so afraid of the stigmas that exist that I'm not willing to undergo that process. I'm not willing to disclose that, okay, I am experiencing a challenge right now. I am compromising this area. I need to have this addressed. Right? How do we now start breaking some of these stigmas? Speaking. You be more vocal about your mental health. You be more vocal about the concerns associated with mental health. And a little by little, I mean, we can't do it at the same time. We can't do it all at once. Right? Or it won't happen right now. But little by little, one at a time, we can try to destigmatize these associations. Right? And that will help people understand the discrepancy between mental health and mental illness and how we treat persons. Because someone is accessing medication to treat with whatever they're experiencing, it doesn't mean that they are any less than anybody else. Because you are because you are on medication and I'm not. It doesn't mean that I'm any better than you are. It doesn't mean that I am any different from you than, than you are. If someone has a physical ailment, say someone has diabetes, right? It doesn't make you any different from anybody else who doesn't have it. You just have that concern, you just have that, that challenge that you're experiencing that you're dealing with. Right? Just as any other ailment or any other disability. It doesn't make you any different as an individual than anybody else. This is just an area that you have a challenge with. It's just an area that you need addressing differently. You just have to address this area differently, pay more emphasis to these things, and you can function. Right? Just as children with, with you know, any learning disability or any disabilities of any kind, any challenges, you can be included. You should be included by right. You should be. Because you are no less than anybody else. You aren't a less of an individual than anybody else. Because I don't have that particular ailment, doesn't make me better than you. It just means that I have to be more aware that you function differently. And that is it. That is it. It doesn't mean that I can't include you in what I have to do. Or you can't be seen in the same light as I am. It just means that you have this ailment, you have this area of concern, these things are being addressed. That is it. I have my areas of concern too. You may not be seeing them, but we all have some areas of concern. As I said, something will compromise us. We human, we address things differently. Some things just need to be addressed more um, direct, and that is okay. That doesn't make you less than anybody else. So in speaking of mental health, in going forward, we need to speak more about what as opposed to what? Prevention. Mental health and mental well-being as opposed to mental illness. Yes. Right? That perpetuates that negative stigma, that negative cycle, the negative talk associated with therapy and access and support. Go ahead, say your hand in the back. So my son is three years old, right? And I'm a mother. I want to have to address that. Define a melder. He was putting something wrong, but he had some cry, he had some children. And that's children. That's the two children. <laughs> And that could be for a number of different reasons. So, so children, children naturally throw tantrums, right? They test in their limits. A child wants to see how much they can go, how much they can get away with on a clean slate, right? How much can I do and, and not get in trouble, right? How much can I do to get what I want and get that instant satisfaction, that instant gratification and not be penalized for it? So children will throw tantrums, throw down themselves, do something to, you know, get the attention of the caregiver. Right? In, in, in those cases, those are normal childhood behaviors. Those are normal um, behaviors that children exhibit. Right? It, as I said, it can become more extreme, and that is, that is when we have to recognize these things. Right? And we have to address it as it happens. Because if the child, say the child, slams on the chair, and we leave it unaddressed, and we say, okay, the next time he does it, I will address it. That has already implanted in that child that me turn over the chair with no consequence means it's okay. At whatever age, children pick up these social cues. 
if I react a particular way to, be, to me, if I react a particular way as a, as a child, right? I react a particular way and I realize that there's no consequence for this action that automatically becomes okay in my eyes, in my little brain, that, that is okay, this is normal behavior. This is how I'm supposed to respond. Because if there's no consequence to follow, then what is the problem with my behavior? But if that is addressed right away, then they start understanding, okay, this behavior results in this consequence. So maybe they will do it again, and then over time they will realize that, okay, if I keep doing this, this is the consequence, it has to be consistent. If I keep doing this, this is the consequence, they, will, they themselves will realize, that, okay, this is wrong behavior. And they will, they will adjust that behavior accordingly, based on the actions to follow that behavior. So over time, just keep, keep addressing it, and over time. Over time, it, sh it should be adjusted. If not, then maybe a more behavioral um, concern that will need further, further clinical assessment. Yeah, but just give it some time, just keep addressing it as you, as you, um, you usually would. Just address it, let them know, and just speak to them, communicate. Communicate. I always say children are little adults, eh? They are just small adults, right? They understand information. They understand social cues. They learn from the environment. Social beings, they learn from the environment. Observational learning, right? So they learn from us. Right? We have to be very mindful of what information we expose them to, what they see us doing, how they see us reacting to a situation. They will react to a situation, how we react to a situation. And we have to be mindful of how we do things when they are in our presence. So you can keep addressing the behavior, um, ensure that the addressing of it is consistent, so it doesn't happen one time and then you address it, and then two times it happens and you leave it alone, one time again you address it. It has to be consistent. So over time, that child will develop the understanding that, okay, if I perform this behavior, this is going to be the consequence. So this behavior is no longer good. This behavior is a bad behavior. Because of the reaction that follows, I will no longer elicit the same behavioral response. Uh, so, a uh, hand on the side? Sure. Oh. No, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right, you're absolutely right. If I'm not in a space to give, if I am compromised, then what can I really give to that child? How much can I really, how much energy can I really expel over this situation? I can't give if I'm empty. It goes back to the emotional deposits, the emotional withdrawals. So I'm a situation like that, an experience like that can be an emotional withdrawal. If I'm not, if I'm not equipped with the emotional resources to give to that situation, I will remain emotionally compromised. When we are emotionally compromised, we act on impulse, as opposed to acting on reason and acting on logic. We don't have, we no longer have that space between impulse and action. When we are emotionally compromised, we no longer have that space. So I act as a situation happens, I'm already emotionally compromised. I don't have the emotional resources to appropriately address the situation at its best. I act on impulse. I no longer act on logic, I no longer act on reason, I no longer act on rational, right? I now act on impulse. So I tend to, as I say, you lash out. You lash out on the child, right? Or you lash out on the person. And that's because you are compromised, which is okay, it's okay to be compromised. We hear one, it happens. But we have to be in a space that we are ready to acknowledge these things. So I know when I feel this way, how I manage myself so that I don't respond 
inappropriately to situations. Right? Understood? That answer the question. Or if that kind of solidified the, the, the concerns you had. Okay, good. Go ahead. Um, with, with mental illness and, and mental health, um, mental health, you understand? Well, we know there's a stigma attached to those things. I know what our children have done, they are the outpatient centers, so that people feel more comfortable that they only walk in the place that's my people, they remember right. the wellness center. So it gives you a sense of wellness instead of mental health. Right. And I'm thinking with the psychological society is in children to be good. If they're looking at rebranding how we we look at mental illness or mental health in terms of adversity. Maybe the same you see when I was rushing it, you can it. If you could see something with psychologists talking about coming and doing mental checkups and stuff, right. so that become a part of our psyche that, hey, I really can feel nice stress and thing. I need to walk in that center right. just as somebody sees me. Are we moving towards that? Are we moving the stigma in that way? We should be moving towards, um, towards removing that stigma in the same way, right? On a smaller scale, we are because there are a number of concerns with agencies having psychological services or counseling services or psychiatric care on their signs. Prisons have concerns about that. So a lot of agencies um, change the names. So it's very, very general. So Elder and Associates, Families in Action, Dolly and Associates. So it's, it's very general. It doesn't sound like, like psychological services or counseling services being, um, being offered here. And that's because of the concerns person had accessing that support. And persons, you know, in the public seeing them entering these agencies, they had major concerns. So on a on a another scale, they have been uh, agencies have been putting things in place to circumvent some of those challenges. But these stigmas are so strong. These stigmas are these stigmas exist mm -hmm. because these stigmas aren't haven't been developed over the past week. This has been existing over a period of time. The same way that it has developed over a period of time, it's going to take a period of time for it to be diminished. For us to re relanguage that whole association with therapy and mental health. Yes, correct. Are they will place a HR department or even tell workers that they can access that if they have stress? Right. And um, persons don't even know that they could just go to the HR department right. and ask. And, and those are things that will help you because when you're in the place and it don't mean that you have a place where you can go and actually get counseling that is confidential and that. So I'm saying a lot of advertisement and, and education is needed when we speak about mental health and mental illness. Correct. And it has to because we live in a really stressed society, especially now with internet and all that. And we are working around here, working time bombs. Mm -hmm. And people trip at the slightest thing, and we need to let them get on the psyche heat. If I'm feeling I'm reaching that point, I could walk into here and just sit down and just back Correct. down. Correct. Prisons should be more open to accessing these services. These services are there for prisons to access. Right? I experience some challenge, I need some additional support. I can't always support myself. If, okay, in your work capacity, whatever your work capacity may be, you may not be able to do 100% of your job on your own. You may need to go to someone else to make a referral to get some support to get some additional information. You complete a certain part of it, you move it forward to someone else, they complete the action. You may need to be lazy with other persons. Right? You can't um, we have to lead with teachers in schools. So we have to collaborate with them. They are also included in our child's learning experience. Right? We don't have all of the resources to treat with everything, just as life situations. We would experience a challenge, and that is okay. I can't reiterate enough that that is okay, right? When we, um, speaking of mental health as well, right? Something as simple as stress. That word stress has become so cliche again that we don't, we don't acknowledge or recognize the effects that the stress is having on us. And stress can affect in a number of different ways, a number of different symptoms that we have to look out for. Right? So we have the physical symptoms of stress, the, the body aches, the body pains. Some people get headaches, nausea, as bad as vomiting. But you know, on streams, every pain you get is a gas pain. Mm -hmm. So for two months, three months, you're drinking your hot tea every morning because you have a pain in your chest or a pain in your neck. It might be a gas pain, it might be stress. Right? It might be stress. You may need to address these areas and pay attention to it. They are the emotional symptoms, emotional volatility. Your emotions are all over the place. 
right? You have your cognitions, your cognitive symptoms, easily forgetting things. You rest on something here now, you want to take a walk, you come back, you can't remember where you rest on your phone. Right? It happens. You might be stressed. Right? You can't stay oriented to task. You can't remain focused on what you have to do. We might be stressed. There are the behavioral symptoms. Um, some persons overeat when they're stressed. Some persons undereat. Some persons oversleep. Some persons undersleep. The insomnia. Right? These are the different symptoms that we have to recognize and be aware of. You have to be aware of your body and then put it as a source of energy. So when you're excited, you feel the energy in your body. We very easily recognize those. Right? When you're excited, you feel high energy. When you feel sad, you feel low energy. Right? When you're angry, that's high energy being produced as well. We have to be aware of how our body feels as a source of energy. So when we experience a situation, we understand how we feel, we understand how I manage myself, so you answer most appropriately. You treat with the situation most appropriately. Yeah, but I have another question. Sure. In Come in. Our children, all right, our children will also be subjected to stresses in a real life Correct. as well. Maybe I'm Correct. Correct. But we as parents, how do we look at it, how do we manage it, how do we identify it? Right. And first has to do with recognizing any change in that child's normal routine. How they normally function, you would know how they, how they normally function. You would know how they function on their everyday basis, when they function at their best. When something is changed in there, they are compromised in some way, you as a parent or as the prime caregiver will recognize some difference in how that child is presented. You will recognize something maybe in their sleeping patterns, maybe in their eating patterns, maybe in how they behave, how they remain, how they are remain seated at whatever particular time. You will understand any changes in their behavior. You might be the first person to recognize those little changes. That is when you can understand that, okay, something is something that child is experiencing, we start to zone a little closer. So you pay more attention to, to those little changes. So we're able to recognize, okay, these are the areas in which the child is being affected. So we address those areas accordingly. In many cases, our children, because of being subjected to their routines and adjusting and accepting that their routines, if things change, that affects them Correct. adversely. Yeah. So we need to pay attention to those things as well. Close, close attention. Any changes in there? everyday routines because that can affect them very very well. I just had one more question and I'll take this question and then I have to close. Well, it kind of becomes tricky when you mention